Hello again, everyone. Welcome to our briefing on the Alana CubeSats, also flying as auxiliary payloads on the Delta II on Thursday morning. We will also take questions from the media at the uh, conclusion of the presentations, and then uh, social media can also ask questions as well by using hashtag AskNASA. And we'll start first with Scott Higginbotham, who is the NASA Alana Mission Manager from the Kennedy Space Center in Florida. Dave Klumpar, the Firebird 2 Principal Investigator, and who is the Director of the Space Science and Engineering Laboratory at Montana State University in Bozeman, Montana. Then to John Bellardo, the ExoCube Principal, Code Principal Investigator, from the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. And finally to David Ryder, the Griffiths Principal Investigator from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena. So we'll start first with Scott Higginbotham, the Alana X Mission, less Alana 10 Mission Manager. Scott? Thank you, Thank George. You. Um, for those that may not be familiar with what a CubeSat is, it, basically it is a research nanosatellite that conforms to certain standard features, in particular uh, relative to size and, and, and shape and volume. The smallest CubeSat that we fly is what we call one unit or one U, and a U is 10 centimeters on a side, so a 10 centimeter cube. On this particular mission, we have four satellites that we're launching. Um, two of them are what we call 3U, meaning that they are 30 by 10 by 10, roughly. And the uh, other two are 1.5U, which means that they are about 15 centimeters by 10 by 10. These four CubeSats will be uh, launched into space contained within some standard dispensers that we've procured. Um, the particular dispenser we're using on this mission is a P-Pod, which is a Poly Pico Satellite Orbital Deployer. Um, the P-Pod is designed and built by the fine folks up at the California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo, or Cal Poly. And this is a P-Pod right here. The P-Pod is essentially a very sophisticated jack-in-the-box, but you'll see there's no handle that you can crank. Um, it is a metal box that contains the CubeSat to keep the CubeSat from, from harming anything and to keep it contained on ascent. At the appropriate time on orbit, the signal is sent from the launch vehicle to the P-Pod. There is a non-explosive actuator that goes right here, and that, uh, that actuator uh, then allows the door to open. The door opens up. It's spring-loaded. And then, those, as you can see inside, there's a pusher plate that's attached to a large spring. That large spring provides the impulse to push the cubes out, out or CubeSats out into the space environment at over one meter per second. So, uh, the four CubeSats that we're flying on this mission were all selected through for flight through the NASA CubeSat Launch Initiative, or CSLI. CSLI provides opportunities for educational and nonprofit organizations and NASA centers to, uh, to get CubeSats launched into space, either flying along as auxiliary payloads on unmanned vehicles or being flown up and ejected from the International Space Station. The CubeSat launch initiative selection process is competitive, and each proposer has to come forward and demonstrate the merit and feasibility of their satellite that they're proposing and also they have to demonstrate how that satellite meets one of NASA's strategic or more than one of NASA's strategic objectives relative to technology demonstration, science and exploration, or education. And in the case of the uh, CubeSats you're going to be hearing about here shortly, several of them meet objectives in different areas. The, um, since 2010, we have selected 114 CubeSats for flight through CSLI, of which 33 have been successfully placed into orbit to date. And come Thursday, there will be four more to add to that list. Um, ILANA missions, or Educational Launch of Nanosatellite Missions, are how we go about implementing the ultimate goal of CSLI, and that is putting the hardware into space. What we do at the Launch Services Program is we look for rides going into orbit that are going at the right time. At the right, uh, in the right direction, and at the right price. And if we can find a match there, then what we will do is build a manifest to fly on that mission. We'll then procure the launch service, procure the dispenser and the integration services that go along with that, and then we'll ultimately go evaluate all that hardware to make sure that it's uh, suitable for flight. 
our prime directive is that we can do no harm. And so we have to spend a tremendous amount of time and energy proving that the CubeSats and dispensers represent no risk to the baseline um, risk of the mission overall. We can't harm the launch vehicle, we can't harm the primary satellite, we cannot harm the public. And for this mission, uh, Alana 10, again, we have four CubeSats that are flying up in three different P pods. The P pods are mounted on the second stage, on the uh, V struts of the second stage, and are pointed down and, and away. And um, there are signals that will be sent uh, at the appropriate time in orbit for the uh, doors to open and the P pods to be ejected. Specifically, our uh, separation timeline is set up such that the first CubeSat, actually first two CubeSats, the Firebird CubeSats, will be ejected uh, one hour and 45 minutes and seven seconds after launch. The next P pod will then be commanded to deploy um, 100 seconds later, and that'll be Griffix, and then 100 seconds after that, ExoCube will be deployed. Once the CubeSats are deployed, they're on their own, and they're the responsibility of the sponsoring organization to control. It's not NASA, it's the institutions that you'll be hearing from next. Um, the satellites will not start sending radio signals to the ground till about an hour at the earliest after they're deployed. And um, so the earliest that we expect that we will start hearing from the CubeSats is later on in the afternoon on Thursday or into Thursday evening. So in summary, um, all of our hardware is on board and it's ready to go fly. It's a thrill to be here. And uh, I do want to acknowledge two groups before I pass it over to Dave. The first is uh, the, the fine team again at Cal Poly that, that built the CubeSats, or built the uh, P-Pods rather, and did all of our integration work for us. Um, that team, Alicia Johnstone, Ryan Nugent, and Justin Foley did an absolutely outstanding job. And then lastly, I want to acknowledge our mission integration team back within the Launch Services Program led by Bill Atkinson, who's here in the room with us. Um, they are responsible for doing all of the work to verify that all of this hardware meets all of the stringent standards that NASA uh, makes us apply to this hardware, and they did also an outstanding job. So with that, George, back to you. All right, thank you, Scott. And now to Dave Klumpar, the Firebird 2 Principal Investigator from Montana State. Dave? Thank you, George. I'm very pleased to be here to represent the Montana State University, University of New Hampshire combined Firebird 2 team on the occasion of our upcoming launch as an auxiliary payload with the SMAP mission. Uh, I want to thank NASA's Earth Science Division for allowing our little guys to fly with their big Earth Science mission. Also want to thank the uh, NASA uh, Launch Services Program Alana team uh, for providing these opportunities uh, that allow the students who've designed and built these satellites to actually see the fruits of their labor pay off by operating the spacecraft in the space environment. You know, it's, it's, it's one thing to do PowerPoint presentations and studies in an undergraduate environment, and it's something else to actually get out there, put that learning, that, exp that, that knowledge that you've gotten from the classroom to work and, and actually build a piece of hardware and get it to its destination and operate it from the space environment. That's just huge for the students. And we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of the Launch Services Program Alana team uh, at Kennedy Space Center. So thanks again, Scott. And um, please pass my thanks on to Big Daddy back there at uh, Cape Canaveral in the Launch Services Program. I think uh, I'm referred to uh, the gentleman who actually heads up and really, uh, really makes the Alana program what it is. Um, uh, so if I can have the first graphic, uh, I want to talk a little bit about the scientific mission of Firebird. It is a scientific investigation. Um, as I said, uh, primarily uh, built by students at Montana State University and, uh, and at the University of New Hampshire. Um, Montana State really provided the uh, spacecraft bus and did the integration and testing work while the scientific payload was designed and built at the University of New Hampshire. Uh, the investigation is supported by the National Science Foundation and as you've heard today, is being launched by NASA. So we have a lot of government presence uh, in, our, in our process. Let's get to the scientific purpose. Um, the purpose is to investigate a, a mysterious phenomenon 
uh, known as a little bit of a technical term here, relativistic electron microbursts. Um, I'll tell you a little more about that, just briefly. But why do we do this? It's important because the Earth's Van Allen radiation belts, which is the reservoir of the very intense radiation that can damage spacecraft and cause uh, health problems with human beings, that reservoir is a fairly stable environment some of the time. But there's a mysterious process going on out there that jiggles the Earth's magnetic system in such a way that some of those very energetic, they're called killer electrons for obvious reasons, can be dumped into the Earth's upper atmosphere and precipitate out of the radiation belts, causing perhaps one of the most significant losses uh, from the uh, Van Allen radiation belts. Um, we don't understand this process. The extent of the process hasn't been quantified. And so the Firebird mission, um, if I could have that view graph back, the Firebird mission is, uh, uh, is focused on uh, understanding, and the words of the acronym really tell it. We're looking at the relativistic electron burst intensity. How intense are these radiations as they rain down on the Earth? What is the range? What is the spatial extent over which they, they bombard the Earth? And how dynamic are they? Uh, in order to do this, um, we fly the two Firebird satellites in a dog chasing a cat formation uh, deep uh, well above the Earth's atmosphere, but very low altitude compared to where the Van Allen probes are measuring uh, the radiation out there in the space environment. Those Van Allen probes, uh, built by NASA and launched about two and a half years ago, uh, are, are embedded in this radiation belt environment, and they're understanding exactly, they're measuring all of the phenomenon that are of any importance um, that's going on out there. Unfortunately, they're blind to the very important, very small spatial dynamic region. They're blind to what's being dumped into the Earth's upper atmosphere. And so with these two focused Firebird satellites, we look down at the upper atmosphere and see what's actually coming in. Uh, and, and the Ben Allen probes are able to tell us, ha, ah, here's what we saw out there at the same time you saw these things uh, jumping into the atmosphere. So um, let's go on to, uh, to the next slide. It shows a uh, photograph. So in order to accomplish this investigation, it takes uh, the two satellites, as I described, uh, cat and dog. And um, each of these satellites um, have been built by students at the University of at Montana State University and the payloads built by uh, students at, Mon at the University of New Hampshire. Um, they're identical, um, but they, and they're very diminutive as, uh, as Scott just uh, described. They're about 10 centimeters on a side, about 15 centimeters tall. Nevertheless, they carry all of the fundamental uh, hardware that the much larger brethren like SMAP uh, carry. Uh, they have, as you can see in the image, they have solar panels uh, to charge the batteries that are, that are providing power to the satellites during uh, eclipse um, through a power system that very carefully controls and monitors the, the power being distributed around the satellite. Um, they carry uh, full downlink communications. There are uh, RF transmitter on board. Uh, antennas that are wrapped around the side walls of the spacecraft and deployed once we get into orbit. Um, these, uh, there's a transceiver, a transmitter, uh, sorry, a receiver on board to, to, to receive and decode uplink signals, and finally a GPS system to tell us where we are and to time the relative, the relative timing between the two uh, satellites. Uh, and of course, not last but not least is the very important scientific uh, payload. So um, I want to close with uh, a little video. The um, School of Film and Photography at Montana State University produced the, this little 30-second video 
uh, regarding the program and the missions that we're accomplishing with these uh, CubeSats. Uh, can we roll that video? At Montana State University, we build real satellites for NASA. To most people, the MSU campus looks like this. But to me, it now looks like this. Our satellite has orbited the Earth over 5,000 times, advancing technology throughout the world. We work together, we shape the future. The, um, the university is so proud to be, uh, uh, to be a part of this program, uh, augmenting our students' formal education with such exper experiential activities, that this video was shown uh, during the halftime break uh, at the uh, Brawl of the Wild, as it's called. Uh, that's the traditional once a year annual uh, battle on the football field between Montana State University and uh, the University of Montana. Uh, it was shown uh, on national TV during that, uh, during that game. Uh, don't ask me how the game came out because I don't really follow football. <laughs> uh, and uh, I think I'll turn it back to you, George. All right, thanks, Dave. And now to John Bellardo, the ExaQ co-principal investigator for California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. John. Thank you, George. I'm pleased to be here representing the ExaCube team. Um, despite the fact that all these satellites are small, there's a huge team of folks that goes behind them to help make them what they are. Um, so I want to start out by thanking a number of the institutions that have been involved with ExaCube to make it as successful uh, as it has been thus far. Uh, first and foremost, Scientific Solutions was providing a lot of the, the leadership on the project, right, in uh, both um, technical and uh, scientific. Um, we've also been working with the University of Wisconsin-Madison, the University of Illinois Urbana-Champaign. Uh, on the science side, they have a number of scientists who have contributed to the science design of the experiment and are standing by to begin analyzing the data as soon as the data starts coming down um, approximately a month or so after we're deployed from the Peapod. Uh, we also worked with NASA Goddard. They were involved with making the science instrument that we have in the CubeSat itself. And then finally, the team at Cal Poly was in involved with designing the bus building the satellite, and integrating the instrument from Goddard and doing all the, the final testing. Um, the Cal Poly team is the team that I am responsible, partially responsible for advising. Uh, they're a team of students, and as is the theme with these satellites, uh, they're largely student-built. They provide a phenomenal educational opportunity to get real-life experience for the students um, to complement their classroom education. It's a wonderful opportunity, and a, a lot of thanks goes to the Alana program to help facilitate that. So, thank you. Thank you, John. And next to David Ryder, the Griffix Principal Investigator from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. David? Yes, good afternoon. Uh, I'm going to tell you about Griffix. Griffix stands for GeoCape ROIC In-Flight uh, in Validation Experiment. So in some sense, this is a little bit different than the other two in that we are a technology validation flight. And I want to tell you a little bit about why we're worrying about validating technology, and it's actually in the title of the, it's in the acronym of our uh, experiment, but it's GeoCape. GeoCape is a mission that's been envisioned by NASA for quite a while, and uh, a lot of people have been working on it. But when we first started thinking about GeoCape, we realized fairly early on that there were some key components that we needed to develop in order to pull off the mission. Now, what makes GeoCape unique, at least in our thinking, is that it will be located in a geostationary satellite, which means that it, it, it's stationary with respect to the surface of the Earth. The idea being then that you can look over a big area of the Earth many, many times a day, as opposed to low Earth orbiting missions such as SMAP, where you can only see some places two or three times a week, maybe. Uh, the problem is, is that we didn't have detectors that would take data fast enough to be able to allow us to do um, uh, continental coverage over periods of several hours, which is what our objective was, and most importantly, to be able to measure the composition of the atmosphere over those time and spatial scales. So we needed to develop a detector that allows us to do that, and uh, that's what we are going to test on this Griffix flight is the, uh, uh, the readout integrated circuit, which is what ROIC stands for. I have one here as an example. It's a fairly tiny little piece of hardware, but it's got a whole lot of parts in it. 
This is essentially a detector array that's got 128 by 128 pixels. Uh, you multiply that out, that's about 16,000 detectors. But even better than that, uh, in order to be able to make it go as fast as we needed it to go, we end up um, building analog to digital converters into every pixel. So essentially, this is an all digital focal plane detector array, uh, which is truly unique in the, in, in the fact that it can digitize at very high rates. This one runs at about 8 kilohertz, which is really unprecedented. Well, every time you go and make something like this, you always worry that you forgot something and it won't work right when you get it on orbit. So. Uh, a CubeSat is a really a rather uh, uh, ideal and efficient and quick way to go about demonstrating that you can actually make the same thing work on, on the, in space, and uh, that's what we've done. This is our Griffix uh, model, a plastic model of our Griffix spacecraft. It's a 3U. Uh, we've built a camera that is down here in the bottom half of this. The outside is covered all with solar panels that provides the power for the satellite. Um, the rest of it is just, uh, I want to be careful, I was going to say standard electronics, nothing standard in here. Uh, the data handling system, the command and data system, the radios, the power subsystem. And so combined, we're going to be able to go and put a, our camera in orbit and take pictures of the Earth and demonstrate that our readout integrated circuit and the, uh, uh, works the way that we need it to work to be able to go do the GOK mission. Um, I also want to... Uh, make sure that I acknowledge the Earth Science Technology Office at NASA headquarters. They've been very good about funding the development of technology for future missions for Earth sciences. And in this case, they've been very generous with us. Uh, along with that, the educational part of it, we also are partnered with a university, which is the University of Michigan. This Jamie Cutler's group, who put several 3U CubeSats into orbit, and uh, we depended on their experience. And they've also had a great time with all their students trying to figure out how to make all this stuff work. So at that, I'll close and turn it back to George. So. All right. Thanks, Dave. We're going to go back now to John Bellardo from Cal Poly, who will discuss uh, some about the uh, uh, science uh, objectives on his mission. John? Thank you, George. Uh, the science objectives, the science uh, behind Exacube is to measure the density of particles in the upper atmosphere, uh, specifically particles that have an atomic mass of less than 40. Um, measuring the particles in place in the upper atmosphere is very important. It's something that has not been done in approximately 30 years. Uh, we've been largely relying on ground-based measurements, which have uh, inaccuracies and uh, require calibration in the instruments to be able to take reasonably accurate readings through the atmosphere. Um, so we're excited to provide the opportunity to take measurements in place in the upper atmosphere, use them to recalibrate or refine the calibration of existing ground-based instruments, use them to refine and validate models that predict what these densities should be over time so that long after ExoCube is uh, no longer functioning or no longer in orbit, we can still enjoy uh, some of the benefits of the, the science data that, that's taken. Um, this is the engineering model for Execute. It's a 3U satellite. Looks like most of the other 3Us when it's deployed from the Peapod. Uh, one of the unique features that Execute has uh, is they have deployable booms. So sh a little while after deployment, there will be booms on either side of the satellite. This is just one that deploy that help stabilize the satellite so that it's always pointing in the correct direction so the particles enter the mass spectrometer correctly. That's one of the interesting uh, features that the students at Cal Poly helped build into the, the satellite. Thank you, George. Back That's, to you. All right. Thanks, John. And we're ready now to take questions. And uh, remember, social media can also ask questions by using hashtag AskNASA. And uh, we'll go first to questions here in the room and then take social media. Um, Justin. Uh, my question, uh, two two parts uh, for Scott. Uh, I was wondering if you could tell us uh, what orbit the, the satellites will be dropped off at. Uh, I think Vern had mentioned that there's going to be a burn after SMAP uh, separation. And also, uh, for for all of you, uh, how long do you expect uh, your, your uh, respective missions to last? 
All right, we'll start, and I'm embarrassed. I don't have that committed to memory. I do have it in my computer, so we'll get back with you on that. Um, we are separating, uh, I think it's like a half a degree of inclination from the SMAP orbit, just so that we get enough away that we don't have any conjunctions, but we'll get you the details on the orbit. I could comment. <clears throat> I'll help Scott answer the question. My memory uh, serves me right, and I'm not sure it does. Um, at my young age anymore, but I believe that uh, the initial parameters in terms of altitude and uh, uh, apogee is at about 600 kilometers and uh, perigee is down at about 450 if I remember that right. So it's a little bit elliptical and uh, the parameters predict that uh, we'll be in a truly sun synchronous orbit. Now these are pre-launch predictions so that we pass over, the satellites pass over each of our ground stations at exactly the same time, uh, twice a day, every day at exactly the same time. There's no phasing, there's sun synchronous. Um, and, um, and so we're, we're very excited to be in that kind of an orbit. Lifetime, uh, that, that orbit will give us a very long lifetime, um, uh, close to a decade or more for the satellites to actually be in space before they decay into the atmosphere, and they will decay into the atmosphere. They don't uh, create space debris. Uh, we clean them out uh, naturally. Um, and uh, operationally, we would be disappointed if we don't get at least a year of operation out of the two Firebird satellites. We're, we've designed them uh, to operate for that period of time. There's no, there are no consumables. There's no reason why they shouldn't last. Knock on wood. Comments from the others. <coughs> um, for Execube, the the hoped lifetime for for the operational side is uh, six to twelve months. Uh, but again, there's nothing. Uh, yeah. If we could last a lot more than twelve months, we continue to take measurements and continue to get data, and that would be wonderful. Yes, and I was, my, my answer is pretty much the same. Uh, what gets in the way with them coming down is, is just drag, space drag, and eventually they'll fall out of the sky. And so they'll go for almost a decade, and there's nothing in, uh, at least in Griffiths, and I think it's true of the others, that would cause it to quit working uh, in something any other than yours. So we take a few, they are CubeSats, they're built by students. We do take a few shortcuts. And the good thing about that is we get to try out an awful lot of electronic hardware that uh, we probably wouldn't be allowed to do on uh, a more expensive mission. And so part of this, in this case at least, we're, we're kind of anxious to find out how all the other electronics work, work too. So it's all a big experiment. Other questions here, Janine. How valuable are these, um, this kind of hands-on lesson for the students? I'll answer that because I work at a place where we actually hire a lot of these pe people that graduate, and it makes a tremendous difference. Uh, they come in with experience being around spacecraft. They understand a little bit about the space environment. Uh, they understand a little bit about what you have to go through to get things launched. They understand a lot about what you need to do to test things so that they will work with some reliability when you do launch them. So it's extremely valuable. I'll just add a uh, comment on, on the fact that uh, the students are, are they're practicing their careers. They're practicing what they've learned in the classroom, but they're practice, practicing it in a very interdisciplinary way. When, when the students come together to put one to design and build one of these satellites and take it through test and space qualification, uh, we have mechanical engineering students, thermal engineers, computer science students, computer engineering, electrical engineering, and physics students all in the same room together and they're all bouncing their, their own little ideas off of each other. Well, we should do it this way. And the other guy says, no, you, I can't support that much power uh, on my thermal system. And, and so it's a real interdisciplinary interaction that makes them, that hones their skills and makes them so valuable to, to JPL and, and the other uh, uh, employers in the aerospace industry. All right, we can take social media questions now. Have uh, we got some that have come in? All right, wonderful. This first question comes from Twitter user Harm, who asks, "What are the advantages of CubeSats over normal satellites, and how will these satellites benefit NASA?" 
Well, let me uh, take the second one first. And uh, how they dem how they benefit NASA is one: we have a, a mission to help Im improve the uh, the educational opportunities for students in the United States relative to science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And as you heard, um, this is an ab absolutely outstanding way for students to get real-world experience on uh, building flight hardware that they can take into their careers and hopefully keep them motivated to stay in the aerospace or other technical fields. So then on top of that, we get the opportunity to go demonstrate technology, as Griffix is going to do, and as uh, all three satellites are going to do, we, we gain scientific knowledge, which is also one of NASA's strategic objectives. So, uh, so we, we get all the above. And as far as uh, benefits over larger satellites, well, I, I think you heard that too. Um, you can experiment. Um, the cost is such that we can try and fail and try again and fail or learn something every time incrementally and get better at something without making the huge investment that one would have to make if you were to buy a large satellite and invest in the launch service for that large satellite. I'll just add a, a word if I could. About, uh, about the technology development that can be done with these very small satellites. Uh, I happen to bring along uh, today uh, the next satellite that, uh, it's, 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 it's a copy of the structure of the next satellite uh, that Montana State will be building. And uh, if I, uh, this is a completely 3D printed flight model, flight satellite. It's not a model, it's not just a, a test uh, demonstration. This this 3D printed uh, structure will actually fly in the space environment. It's not made of aluminum, it's all plastic. And that's the kind of technology that we can test in the space environment at a very low cost with CubeSats. And, and I'll add one thing, inexpensive and faster. I mean, Griffix, which I think, well, we took a little longer than we anticipated, it was less than three years from when we first thought about it, to when we're actually going to launch it, that's absolutely remarkable in, in the space business. So, Next question comes from a Facebook user, Warren, who asks, were the students at Montana State completely autonomous, or were they asked to follow a specific template due to the size and safety restrictions, or were they consulting with NASA engineers frequently, and if so, how frequently? Uh, there is a very specific, uh, there is a very specific requirement on the size and mass of these CubeSats. You will see that they all have very identical features from the outward appearances. Internally, everything that goes into them is entirely up to the design team for each specific mission. Our students are, are advised by a couple of full-time uh, spaceflight engineers that work with the faculty, uh, myself and another faculty member, to guide the students. But they're left a lot on their own. A big part of this, this whole adventure is, uh, is trial by error and trial by fire. In other words, we throw it at the students to, to come to the table with a, with a job well done. And we help them along the way. We mentor them. We guide them. We, we run regular meetings each week uh, with the students. But the ultimate design work and the fabrication is done by the students themselves. And to Add on to that, um, from a government perspective, we levy a fairly lengthy list of requirements on each satellite provider to ensure that the hardware they're providing is going to be safe to fly. And so we work then with our integration contractor, Cal Poly, and with each of the teams to make sure that they have provided all the evidence necessary to prove to uh, independent authorities that this hardware is safe to go fly. That interaction takes place over the course of the campaign, a little over a year in total, and in the end, we have all of the evidence necessary to show that we are, are clear to fly. Excellent, you just actually answered uh, Twitter user Joe's question about the basic required functions for CubeSats, so thanks for taking care of that. Um, moving on, uh, this question comes from Twitter user Scott, who asks, what is the average total cost of a CubeSat, including development, launch, and mission operations for one, two, and three CubeSats? Well, let's see. I, I think from what I've heard from, because there's multiple pieces of that, and, um, and I don't think none of us control all the pieces, but uh, we, we go out and buy the integration services, the dispensers, the launch service, 
Meanwhile, the satellite providers pay for building and testing the satellite, and then we all pay for the paperwork that goes along with trying to prove that it's okay to fly. I think it's probably safe to say that on average, it's, it's close to a million or $2 million in the end in total for everything. But I think it varies widely depending upon the sophistication of the scientific instrument that's flying on that satellite. Um, every CubeSat that we deal with is, is different. Some um, have very sophisticated, very expensive items inside, and some are, are very simple and straightforward. So there's a wide range, but probably if, if I were to say on average, it's, it's one to two million dollars. Additional questions on social media. Indeed, we have a few more here. This one comes from Twitter user Larry, who asks, do CubeSats have active control systems? Uh, they're working on it. In fact, some, some do. Uh, mine does not. It's all passive. Uh, it's sort of fly, it's got magnets in it and it flies on the magnetic field lines of the Earth. But I know at JPL we're working on several where we actually have gas propulsion system. Uh, it's particularly important if you start thinking about sending a CubeSat out of Earth's orbit because it takes some energy to, k to get it on its way to where it's going. So uh, Griffix doesn't. I don't. Griffix doesn't. ExoCube uh, does have attitude control, um, determination control, absolutely. And as you said, it depends on the satellite, depends on the mission, whether or not you need it. Obviously, that's going to increase the complexity and drive some of the costs of the satellite if you need to include attitude control. Um, ExoCube does not have full three-axis attitude control. There are definitely satellites you see that have the full three-reaction wheels and can uh, have full three axis control. Exocube, um, as I showed you the booms before, that's part of the system, right? They have the gravity gradient booms, one on either side, and then there's a single wheel in the center which helps stabilize the axis in the other act and stabilize the satellite in the other axis. So it uses gravity gradient to help stabilize two of the axes, and then it uses the wheel uh, to help with the third. So it's a form of attitude control. It's not as precise as a, a three wheel system. Um, but that wasn't necessary for this particular mission. Well, a follow-up question to that comes from Twitter user Nil, who asks, how does the boom ensure that a CubeSat will face towards Earth rather than rotate freely in space? Um, the gravity gradient effect uh, it works by gravity pulling slightly harder on the bottom boom versus the top boom, and that tends to cause a satellite to stay oriented with one of the booms facing Earth. Um, there are a couple of other coils here uh, that we have to align the satellite roughly in that orientation before we deploy the booms so we can ensure that the satellite is correctly oriented vertically um, before we try to stabilize it in the third axis. All right, uh, this next question comes from Twitter user Matthew who asks, could something like this be used for conducting similar missions uh, that go along with things to the moon, asteroids, or even Mars? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah. And in fact, we're going to go do that. Uh, we have some missions that, uh, that we're working on right now to send some CubeSats along with larger spacecraft to Mars. And then um, I'm actually working on uh, a mission, the, the first SLS mission that's coming up, EM-1. We're going to fly CubeSats on that mission that are going to go to the moon, to near-Earth asteroids and out into deeper space to do other interesting things. So absolutely, NASA is interested in seeing that happen, and we're going to make it happen. I, I just add, uh, right now, there's, a, there's an opportunity uh, to the scientific and university community broadly from uh, NASA's uh, um, Planetary Sciences Division. And uh, right now, as we speak, there are dozens of teams out there uh, working on their proposals that are due on March 13th to fly on this EM-1 mission or a similar um, mission to do planetary science. Very much so. It's a great seg to this question here from Twitter user Elaine who asks, how do you choose which universities to partner with for projects like these? I, I, uh, the, there's, there's a long established sort of collegial relationships, I would say. We, we typically uh, know who's good at uh, one particular subsystem or one particular area. Um, typically, as was described earlier, uh, we do compete for funding uh, for all of these missions, so we want to put the best team forward that we can. Um, we get together, uh, we, cho we choose a particular science investigation, and that drives the instrumentation and the hardware that will be developed. So the teaming, um, you know, it, it's a lot about who you know, kind of, but uh, but but it's it, it's not for, it's the 
Forming the team is not a very formal process. It happens, um, um, it happens at meetings, it happens uh, through email, and eventually a team comes together and, the, and things start to click. But we pretty much know each other before we start. All right, we'll take one more social media question before we wrap up. Last question comes from Twitter user Amber, who asks, what type of data and what format do these CubeSats collect, and how is it received on Earth? Okay. I'll start that one. Um, the data and the format that the data in is in is very specific to the mission. Right? So the data format that we get out of the mass spectrometer on ExoCube is going to look different than the data format on other missions. Now, in terms of downlinking it to Earth, we do use a largely standardized format uh, for communicating the data over the radio, um, namely using AX25, which is part of the amateur radio community. And we do this for interoperability, so that the ground station that we have at Cal Poly can participate in tracking Griffix and helping get the data from Griffix, tracking Firebird, helping get the data from Firebird. So as a community, um, we try to work together to downlink the data, and that level of interoperability is exist does exist when the satellites, when it comes to the actual science data and the format of the data itself, that varies largely from mission to mission. I'll just underscore that uh, the uh, the uh, radio system on which uh, that uh, that that these that many of these cubesats are transmitting from is readily uh, heard by and uh, translated by uh, amateur radio folks. And uh, there's a community of amateur radio uh, enthusiasts around the world, and a subset of that community um, is very active in tracking uh, satellites as they're launched. So we expect um, a colleague from uh, Germany to be the very first person to hear our CubeSat uh, if the orbit predict is right, we'll turn on uh, just as we cross the Mediterranean heading north, and uh, Germany will be right within the, um, the, the, uh, the, um, the, the data band through which uh, the satellite can be, uh, be heard. So, so these amateur radio guys, uh, AMSAT community, really is really helpful for, for this entire university community, and we're really pleased that those guys and gals are out there helping us out. All right, any further questions here in the room? All right, in that event, that's going to conclude this briefing and a programming note about our launch coverage on NASA television, which will start at 4 a.m. Pacific time, 7 a.m. Eastern on Thursday morning. Thank you very much.